This is Twit. It's unclear whether this was done on purpose or by accident, but according to Aaron Wu writing for the information, uh, Twitter intentionally suspended third-party apps, the API, including TweetBot. Mm. Thursday night, I started seeing messages all over, especially on our Mastodon account, twit.social, saying, what the heck? My third-party app is just not logging in. Uh, the information, Aaron Wu got uh, internal messages that lead one to believe that this was intentional on Twitter's part. My bot stopped working. Oh, you had a bot? I, I built used a bot. You used the API. Right, I used the API. I, I, and some of it I did, just did screen scraping, and it just started freaking out. It, it can no longer do its, its job, so I had to turn it off. Interestingly, hey, but all the bots have been defeated. So, you know, yeah, it's no more bots. Turn off the API. Uh, really smart. Mm. Uh, Twitterific said it was still working, but the, the uh, but many of the other ones, including a tweet bot, which is very popular, Twitterific, uh, they said that it was working, but then I've seen the information says that it's not. Phoenix for Twitter, Ecrophone. Tweet Birdie. delete is down as well. Oh, it's oh, good. I deleted good all my tweets already. <laughs> I know it's quite bad. Well, there's a positive side to the story, and, and that's that it seems that Twitter did it on purpose rather than this accidentally well, happening because something they changed. Here's what the information learned: uh, they saw a internal Slack message from a senior software engineer on Thursday night saying, "Quote: Third-party app uh, suspensions are intentional." Uh, mm -hmm. Yesterday, the information tried to contact that engineer. He refused comment. Internal messages I'm reading from Wu's uh, story seen by the information also show that Twitter employees have been discussing when the decision would be announced publicly. Well, not yet. <laughs> no one. It's one of those big mysteries. Uh, a Twitter employee working. I mean, I think part of it is who would be announcing these things. Twitter has a skeleton staff and almost nobody from comms. They have no I comms. I mean, no one from yep. comms is left. No PR, no comms. And HR the, is a skeleton. Apparently, the API engineering team is mostly gone as yep. well. Yep. So they were in the first round. Yeah, who would announce this? I don't know. A Twitter employee working on project product uh, partnerships asked on Friday. Friday morning when employees could expect a list of approved talking points. You're all in comms now for questions from partners related to third party clients revoked access. Do you want to talk about how the information gets this information, uh, Paris, or is that a um, state secret? I mean, I guess it's somewhat a state secret, but it's the same as all I think journalism happens. We have reporters who their job is to build up kind of networks of great sources people either inside the company or people familiar with these decisions and uh, they're in constant contact. And so I remember kind of seeing in certain groups with colleagues over the weekend of news breaking internally that this was happening and they turned that into a story. Um, I think especially uh, Aaron Wu, the reporter who uh, did this, has been producing really fantastic work for us on the Twitter beat. Uh, and I think that it's kind of, I mean, a lot of, so many journalists have, because it is such a, I mean, the story is ever changing and there are employees constantly on the ins and outs with Twitter leadership that are willing to talk to the press about what's going on. That's basically what's happening there. Yeah. And so you're seeing these Slack messages because they sent you screenshots or or the like. Something like that, yeah. Paul Haddad, who uh, write, is, works for TapBots and uh, writes TweetBot, uh, tooted on Mastodon, almost 24 hours later, still no official, unofficial info from inside Twitter. I'm going to continue as if, this, as if this was all done on purpose. And Paul, now there's evidence it was. Mm -hmm. What now? So uh, TapBots has a Mastodon client, which is in beta right now, called Ivory. Uh, I don't use it, but a lot of people who use it say it's very good. He says, well, we're going to go into hyper mode with just the absolute minimum three to four things that have to be done, finished up, and then off to Apple. Probably going to, in other words, to get an app approval so it can be in the App Store. Probably going to be a bunch of things I'm not super happy with, but I guess we'll fix it in post. Hopefully everyone knows what we're capable of uh, with and can live with some, hopefully not long-lived, Rush, rough edges and missing features. You know, Tweetbot's amazing. Yeah, Ivory will be amazing. But what's what's the long game here? So, I mean, is this just because Musk wants to sell 
a third party app. He wants to reduce the amount of expenses for accessing for the API. I mean, what's what's the cause here? The third party support for Twitter has been something that really drove the adoption of Twitter. So are we just now saying, well, we're done. We've got all the audience we want, and uh, thank you very much. Well, remember, this is not the first time Twitter did this. They did yeah. it some years ago, and actually, I think Jack Dorsey uh, uh, has later said that was a huge mistake to cut off the uh, third-party API. I suspect it's just as simple as we want you to use our web page and our app. Okay. And if you, uh, the new Twitter, I, we haven't talked about Twitter in some time, so I apologize for people thought this was an Elon Musk-free zone, but, but <laughs> if, occasionally we kind of have to. We have to mention this. You smell uh, that? That's the musk. <laughs> oh, no. Such an aroma. You've been sprayed. Well, Oof. and I don't use Twitter anymore, so uh, I'll defer to the... You're, a, you, you're a toot man now? I'm a tooter. We have our yeah. own mastodon since we have for years. Yeah, it's quite nice. And I thought, well, you know, I, don't, I can easily leave Twitter without any consequence. Uh, although I have more than half a million followers, some of whom are actually humans. And uh, it was the breaking point when uh, Musk started calling himself the chief twit. That was a big one. I wasn't happy. That's the name I've used on my socials since 2007. Somebody must have told Elon because he stopped pretty quickly. But that didn't mean that, uh, that he wasn't. He isn't still being called that by mainstream media. So he changed. It looks like at the top of the tw Twitter now it used to be you could go chronological. Mm -hmm. Or uh, latest, no, or uh, oh, home. Did they change which that? Which was, oh yeah, there's no more, There, that little twinkly button is gone. Oh no. You now have very TikTok-like for you and following. <sighs> um, and I mean, I don't know about if either of you guys um, who are using Twitter have the same issue, but for me, I spend too much time on Twitter. But my for you kind of feed is almost all people that I do not follow. It's all like that. We are seeing just likes from people I follow. So instead of uh, popular tweets from accounts that I'm following, it is mostly, uh, you know, tweets liked by people I follow or recommended tweets from different categories. So in order basically to see anybody's tweets that I follow, I have to just do chronological, which is not what I want most of the time. Yeah. So let's talk about what's going on at Twitter, because that's how you started this um, discussion. Elon Musk, we've seen in the past two weeks, has been the person on the planet who's lost more wealth in a short amount of time than anyone else, $200 billion. Tesla shares are tanking. CNET wrote a story back in December how lots of, not lots, but there was a trend among Twi um, Tesla owners who were just not going to renew their leases or backing away because they just didn't like what he was doing. And I think what you're saying is that he's, you know, it's easy Monday morning, Monday morning quarterback, how to run a social media site when you're standing on the outside. But there's a totally different story when you're inside <laughs> trying to make policy and do things and work. And so what we're seeing is the, the supposed genius of this man is not, you know, that genius when it comes to a social media site. And either he's getting bored with it and, you know, uh, or there's a communication breakdown where people are not quite sure what they need to do. I mean, he's supposedly looking for somebody else to run it, right? That's what we keep waiting to hear, who's now going to step in and run it because the internet voted him out. So it's kind of a... <laughs> seems like he's ignoring... Mess, by right? the way, it seems like he's kind of ignoring the results of that poll. Uh, I think it's notable that even after that, he was like, yeah, if I find someone new to be CEO okay. of Twitter, they'll be CEO, but I'm going to run all the tech yeah. and like, platforms. Yeah. I'm going to still I'm run sure. it. Sure. Yeah. yeah, you know, CEO. So um, Scooter X in our chat room says, tell me if this is still the case, Scooter X, that some of these third-party clients are working again. I see your tweet. Um, I, again, I, I don't have a dog in this hunt anymore, and I'm very happy that I don't. Uh, but... I think there's still a lot of people who care uh, deeply about what happens to Twitter, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why you're getting leaks from the company. I mean, yeah. I'm a longtime Apple reporter who, who in the early days when I was working at this place called MacWeek, we'd have all these great stories and people were like, why is all this stuff leaking? And it wasn't leaking because people were malicious. It's because they loved the company yeah. and they wanted to see it get better and do better. And so... You're seeing some people talking about what's happening inside Twitter, not because they want to tear it down. It's because they can't believe it and they want someone to come and help save it or rescue or create enough outside momentum to get some of the 
crazy stuff stopped. You know, I stepped away entirely from Twitter in December leading up to CES for, for like six weeks. And it was wonderful. It was so, I, I, I focused on Mastodon uh, on the, uh, I love the you in our, in our Mastodon. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a fun community. When I came back, I didn't really miss uh, having access to a larger audience. I did miss some of the members of the community that I had built up on Twitter. Now, if they were to come over to Macedon, there would be no reason for me to go back to Twitter. That's the only reason why I still care about that company, because there are some people who I can only connect with over Twitter. That's it. I feel like there's a lesson that needs to be learned here that we have. Many of us have, but some of us have not yet learned which is that at least when it comes to social, this kind of centralized single owner company is ultimately not good for you, whether it's Facebook, look what they're doing to Instagram. I, is anybody happy with the new Instagram? Uh, uh, Elon Musk at Twitter. I, ju I feel like these companies, because their model is not to create a nice conversation, Correct. Correct. their whole business model is to create furor so that it's sticky so it's engaging and as a result you get uh, i think things that are bad for our polity i think they're bad for society i don't think they're good for us whereas these decentralized and i think it's more than just decentralized social networks honestly i think it's also open source that this is maybe the watershed moment maybe i'm being a pie-eyed optimist i also believe it was going to be the year of the linux desktop in 1920 for, but uh, I, I, I think that this may be the watershed moment where we start to realize that computing should not be owned by any company. I would hope so. That blogs should proliferate. Everybody mm -hmm. should have their own blog. That social networks should be diverse and federated. That, that it doesn't make sense for one company to dominate. It's bad for us. Except... And we did a big meeting in the Vatican on this. Uh, it, we did called you? It, yeah, it's a common, it, common good in the digital age. Exactly. If anybody should support open source, yeah. it's the Vatican. And and actually, they asked me about that. They said, what is so sticky about Facebook or Twitter or any of the other social media services? You know, we had mass communications before. Can you say Satan? Well, no. It, oh, no, okay. the, the key word was... <laughs> That's what came to mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the key word was outrage. Yeah, it it's, is. It uh, is. That's social how keep, media that's how they make you. sells on outrage yeah. because outrage spreads so fast and outrage motivates more than anything else. Because if I can get righteously indignant about somebody else, about what someone else did or what someone else said, uh, that spreads. That spreads. Now, if I write this wonderful story about how there's a woman in Philadelphia who was taking care of homeless children that will get like maybe yeah. a day of coverage. But if I write about how there's a woman in, in Pennsylvania who has abused homeless children, oh my God, she will be the but most famous person news. ever. Local news has never been about good news. Newspapers have never been about good news. But it's they, reach. If you want people to read your paper yeah. or watch your TV show, you get them... It doesn't have to always be anger, but you get them, uh, you get them revved up but somehow. But the, the loop, the feedback cycle on social media, the fact that you can get that it's anger instant. cycle so instant. quickly. Yeah. I mean, it's those little mini hits of dopamine. So I guess that's my question. Why are we trying to save Twitter? It's community. It's it, honestly, it's the community. Because that's where your friends are. Yeah. Now there but are that's their, that's to me, that's their heroin dealer's hook. Yes. That's what they're saying. Well, you don't want to lose your friends. And honestly, all it would take is for us to move. It would take us, but some people, a, a lot of people are invested in the years, decades, for, decade for some. Nobody wants to read your old that. tweets. Nobody does. But if I've got an account with 100,000 followers and I really put time into developing well, 100,000 followers, for, yeah. I'm not going to just abandon it. Well, I'm sure for a brand, Connie, that makes a big, that's a big part of it. I mean, I, I would love to see CNET say, no more Twitter, it's ridiculous. But you can't do that. We don't even do that. Twit doesn't even do that. You well, tried to do that. I did it, yeah. but I can't get the company to do it. So at, as somebody who's been in the tech industry for a long time, things come and go, right? And right now, should we save Twitter? I don't know. I mean, yeah, am I, am I used to it? Do I know how it works? Have have brands built communities? But it's also, there's a lot of negativity around there. And we saw 
a lot of you know bad things happen to brands when anybody could get verified that's right true. as a brand and started putting out misinformation yeah, there are a few brands so, who wish they weren't on twitter yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right so i think what we're looking at I, I agree with everything that's been said about the toxicity that brings that social media has brought to the world and all of us spending way too much time looking down and being in these echo chambers that are being hijacked by disinformation and propagandists and outrage cycle drivers. So then the question becomes, what what is the next thing that might inspire and engage people? For a while, everyone thought it was going to be TikTok, just these short little moments that made you laugh. But then there's the Chinese government behind them and who's collecting the data and for what purpose? I'm not saying TikTok is not going to be successful or continue to, to have a lot of traffic, but What's the idea behind it, right? And what's the next level of social engagement that we want to have or that we want to walk away from? So that's the discussions that I think are going to start, especially if more governments, Europe will be ahead of us in the US, start looking at these big tech giants and saying, no, we don't want you to have all that power. We want you to want, want to rein you in in some areas. We're just at the beginning of that. Connie, can I invite you to our next conference in the Vatican? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I would absolutely, as a good Catholic, I would love to come. <laughs> okay. I've even yes. gotten an apartment I, for you. I get, I'll offer you the same apartment that I've been offering Leo for the last five years. <laughs> I, I am, I'm happy to come. But, I, but look, technology, I say this all the time. Technology is a means to an end. It's not an end. And at the beginning, the promise of places like Twitter and Facebook was to connect people in a more easy way where it, you got out of touch with, you know, your high school classmates or your college ca classmates. And now you can get back in touch with them or you want to create um, communities. You know, who wants to go to a movie night or have a potluck? That was the promise. It's been co-opted by people for nefarious purposes. <laughs> so it's the technology inherently isn't bad. It's how it's being co-opted and used by people. And, and and part of that is that we've kind of let it happen. We just let it, yeah. you know, whatever happens, happens. I love the idea of sitting back like you're doing uh, uh, at the, in the church and saying, well, let's think, let's be more conscious about what we do next and think about its impact. I hate to see, and I do think there's a certain amount of moral panic, uh, for instance, around TikTok. I hate to see people say, well, it's big tech, so it's bad. Right. But at the same time, I think little tech is better. <laughs> you know, I really do. I think personal tech is better. Small scale is better. And maybe it's time to wean ourselves off of this adrenaline dopamine hit that we get from going to places like Twitter. Uh, and, and, and yeah, you know, you go to Mastodon. It's not quite so exciting. There's no buzz. It's just conversations. Mm -hmm. It's pictures of the Vaticats. <laughs> it's kind of pleasant in a way that, the Twitter isn't, and maybe we just need to get used to, you know, kind of. It's like a, a sugar addict. It's at first, it's very hard not to eat stuff laden with sugar, but uh, I don't know. One don't of the know. issues, I feel like, is a better way is a one channel. So one channel was a strategy that has been developed by um, enterprise communications companies that allowed companies to have quote unquote one channel to to touch bases with their customers. And that meant it combined the feeds from social media, from oh, their own internal communication systems, emails, et cetera, et cetera. Internally, that's what they saw. Right. So uh, they, they wanted the customer to be able to move from one anywhere. type of communication to another, and you continue the conversation. Is that still... Uh, that's still going. That's still that's going. That's good. I right? like that idea. But social media, specifically Twitter, was a huge part of that one-channel strategy. So if you lose that... That's billions of dollars yeah. that has been invested that they lose. So they're heavily uh, invested. Uh, of course, Twitter wants to silo it. Right. Twitter doesn't want you to have one channel. No, they, they want, your they one want channel you to pay them Twitter. for that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. ACI Learning proudly announces that IT Pro, formerly IT Pro TV, joins its family. With IT Pro, ACI Learning will expand its reach and production capabilities, offering companies the content and learning modes they need at any stage of their development. Visit acilearning.com and let ACI power up your IT team.